realities. The topic I'm going to cover in this piece of the lecture is record keeping. Uh, I hope that as we go through this, most of this information is common sense and repetition of the training you've already received as a chiropractor or veterinarian. But I also think sometimes it, it helps us to be reminded of some of these common sense rules so that we don't make careless mistakes or develop habits that can become problems down the road. First thing to ask about record keeping is why do we keep records? What's the purpose of having records at all? If you look back at the history of medical records, it I think is helpful to you. The, the first doctors used to keep records in a journal, wouldn't be segregated by patient. And it was really the Mayo Clinic was, was one of the first uh, institutions to recognize that the records needed to be created for each patient. And the reason it needed to be created for each patient was so that as a patient worked their way through the system, saw different doctors, went through different departments, they could quickly figure out what had been done already for the patient and what the patient's situation was. So I think it helps to remember that the main reason for creating these records was not to defend litigation or to uh, protect yourself from lawyers. The main purpose of creating records was to provide good care for patients. You know, I think as practices have grown and become more complicated, it's also become helpful for the record keeper to be able to look back and refresh their memory about what they've done, about what's worked and what hadn't worked with a particular patient. So it's helpful to keep these records from a perspective, not just as a, a, a exercise you were going through for no apparent reason, especially when the risk of malpractice is so low working with animals, but to go through the practice of keeping records, creating records for the purpose of helping you and other people provide the best care for patients. Now another reason for keeping records is to be paid by insurance companies. Now pet insurance is still relatively rare so I don't expect that to become much of an issue but it can become an issue when it's time to try to collect payment from your clients. They may question what was performed or how carefully it was performed and if, you're, if you have good records that can help you defend that claim. So main reason for keeping records again is to provide good care for patients Secondary reasons are to protect yourself in litigation and to protect yourself or to help yourself collect on insurance claims or, or claims for fees. Now one benefit of keeping records that people don't think about is the way it communicates the quality of the care that you provide. People who keep sloppy records, records that are incomplete, so abbreviated as to be useless those people communicate that they're not being very careful. People who keep records that focus primarily on how much money can I charge, services that I've, I render and the fees for those services, uh, those people communicate that they're in it for the money, not in it to care for the animal. But I think that the doctors who keep records carefully communicate to their, their clients and to other people, other doctors, and other professionals who look at the records communicates that they are providing good, capable care. And I think one of the things you can do to build your practice as a chiropractor working in animal chiropractic is to produce good quality records and then share those records regularly with the veterinarians that are supervising or working with you on, on the animal care. And that helps the veterinarians develop a trust for your character and your abilities and your skills as a, uh, a caretaker for animals, as a doctor for animals. So take the time, and even though I know this is not the most exciting part of animal chiropractic, but take the time to develop good habits of record keeping. The other thing I'll tell you about record keeping is when you first start a practice and first start keeping records, it can be very time consuming. But as you do it and develop skills, uh, you develop the mental uh, uh, pathways to, to 
create records more carefully, more completely, and more quickly, uh, the amount of time should go down and the quality of the records should go up. But if you don't invest the time to learn how to keep good records, you don't take the time to develop those skills and those mental abilities, you don't uh, ever reach a level where you can keep good records quickly and easily. So first question about records is who owns the records? Generally the person who created the records is the one who owns them. And I usually recommend, particularly with paper records, uh, that the person who creates the record should keep the original, or the office that creates the original should keep the original. When people are examining uh, uh, documents or questioning whether they've been forged or changed, having access to the original and being able to submit it to an expert can be very helpful, can be dispositive of those claims. Now, just because the doctor who created the record owns the record, it doesn't mean they shouldn't share the record. If they receive a proper request to release a copy, they should release a copy either to the client or to other doctors who were involved in caring for the animal. So like I mentioned earlier, when chiropractors are working with veterinarians, those professionals should pretty routinely exchange records between each other. Now, they ought to do it in a reasonably secure manner. Uh, posting it on Facebook is not the way to do it. But to send it through an email or fax uh, is probably appropriate. Uh, one other thing about the ownership of records is to consider who's going to have possession of the records after the practice is closed or sold. Uh, sometimes doctors move unexpectedly. There are family emergencies or financial emergencies that may cause them to close their practice and leave quickly. When they do that, they one, one thing they have to do before they leave is make arrangements for somebody to have possession of the records and to make copies available to clients uh, again after a proper request. Uh, documentation should include patient progress notes. How is the patient responding to care? Is the patient improving or getting worse? A uh, couple things that happen with chiropractic care. Sometimes the patient will respond very positively very quickly and then as time progresses they will reach a plateau where you see little progress or no progress. And sometimes not only do you see a plateau, you see things go backwards and the patient gets worse. Now the reason you want to have that in your notes is there's a couple reasons you want to have it in your notes. The first reason is to, to be able to communicate to the client and remind the client how effective the care was at first so that they understand this has not been a total waste of time. There was a benefit for, for at least one particular point in time. The other reason you keep those notes is it's a red flag to the doctor. Anytime you see a patient getting worse, that means the doctor needs to stop and evaluate whether they're doing the right care, whether they're, they're, they've got an appropriate diagnosis, or whether something additional needs to be done to help the animal recover, to help the animal improve. Um, anytime you see a patient not improving, even if it's only for a brief period of a few weeks. The doctor needs to do something different or somehow address that situation and address it with the client so the client knows that you are also concerned about the patient's lack of progress. On the other hand, if you have no notes showing how the, the patient is improving or progressing, it is very difficult to remember from one visit to the next how the patient might be behaving differently. Of course, since you're working with animals, you can't just give them a simple uh, survey and ask them on a scale of 1 to 10 how their pain is. You have to make observations about how they act, what their gait is like, uh, how they interact with people around them, how they respond to touch. Uh, dictated but not read is a practice used by many MDs. And I think the reason MDs use it is it's kind of an excuse uh, 
to produce a record that has typos and mistakes in it. And I think they, they have this rationale that as long as they didn't proofread it, they can always come back later and make corrections to it. I don't think that's a good practice. When you put out there dictated but not read, you communicate very clearly that I'm not being very careful. And if you're being sued for negligence or carelessness, that is not the message that you want to send. Uh, using sign-in sheets. Now I know in the, in the animal chiropractic practice, uh, particularly when you're working off-premises or working in a barn or at a show, a sign-in sheet may not be appropriate. But if you're seeing animals in an office, having a sign-in sheet creates a very good record that the animal was there on that day. Sometimes when it's uh, time to pay the bill, the client will forget that they brought the animal to you on a particular day. And being able to point to something like a sign-in sheet that was kept at the front desk is a pretty strong indication, uh, assuming the client signed in on it, is a pretty strong indication that they were there on that day. Uh, this kind of sign-in sheet that has the writing from a number of different people is almost impossible to forge or extremely difficult to forge. So if it's got the client's signature on it, it's going to be a pretty strong confirmation that you actually saw the animal on that day and you should be paid for that day. So I recommend keeping sign-in sheets. Um, sign-in sheets should not include extraneous information. They should include only the uh, client's name, patient's name, um, and really not much else. Time of appointment. Uh, general rules for record keeping. Now, as I talk about these because of my age, I will usually talk about them in the context of paper records. But I think it also applies, by and large, to computerized records. Now, first group of these rules is do not erase, do not use correction fluid. That's white out for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, don't use adhesive labels to cover up anything, mistakes or otherwise keep your records in ink. The idea is if you make a mistake you want to correct it appropriately. You don't want to hide the mistake. You don't want to create an appearance that you kept the records in pencil so you could go back and erase things you didn't want people to see. You don't want to use whiteout to cover up mistakes. Uh, you want to make corrections appropriately and generally the way you're going to make corrections in paper records is you're going to draw a single line. Okay, you're not going to try to obliterate the mistake. You're going to draw a single line to strike through the mistake and then you're going to go down to the next entry on your on your notes. You're going to put down today's date when you're making the correction and then you're going to refer back to the previous note and why you're making the correction that you made. Now, as you keep records you will make mistakes. That is a natural human thing and I think when people look at records they expect to see mistakes and I think they're suspicious when there aren't any mistakes. So be sure you, you make corrections appropriately in a way that's transparent for people to see when you made the correction and why you made the correction. Uh, along the same lines, uh, don't skip lines or leave blank spaces. Uh, sometimes what doctors will do when they've, they've sent out something like lab, lab work is they'll leave a little spot in the record, a few blank lines, for them to come back later and fill in what the results of that lab report were. Don't do that. Keep the records in a way so it's very clear you couldn't have re reasonably gone back and squeezed in notes. You've kept chronological notes and if you don't get the lab report for a few days, and then you don't get to look at it for a few days after that, your records will demonstrate when you did look at it and what the results of the lab report were. Uh, don't try to squeeze in notes. Uh, don't put them in the margins. Don't try to squeeze them between the lines. You know, Keep your notes in a reasonable way so that people can tell they were kept contemporaneously and you didn't try to sneak back in later to make changes or to improve your records. Uh, don't indent, uh, you know, along the same lines. You're not leaving space to squeeze in notes. When you get to the end of a line, 
when you finish what you're going to write, you take your pen and you draw a line, like a strike through line, through to the end of the margin. Just like you would do on a check where you want to draw that line to prevent people from changing the amount of the check. You want to do the same thing in your paper records so you can prevent yourself and others from coming back in later and trying to squeeze in something during that little space between the end of the sentence and the end of the margin. Uh, as we've talked about already, make additions and changes appropriately. Uh, perfection is not expected, but making changes in a way that is transparent so people can see what was changed and why is expected. And whether you're keeping records or computerized records, uh, that's, a, that's necessary. Computerized records and systems should be keeping an audit trail that will track when changes were made, who made the changes, uh, and what exactly the original record said. And that audit trail helps to authenticate, helps to demonstrate the accuracy and the authenticity of the record being used. Properly identify the record. In a busy practice, it is all too easy to start writing something down on a piece of paper, thinking, well, I'll put in the client's name later. And then when you find that piece of paper on your desk again a few weeks later, you have no idea who the client was. First thing you should do with, with any record is to identify it to the client and to the patient so that it doesn't get mixed in with the wrong file. If you used forms, like examination forms, either fill in all the blanks or explain why you didn't complete different sections. Okay, it may be that sections are not completed because they're not appropriate for that type of animal or that they're not appropriate for the kind of condition the animal is, is there for. And if you explain that in your records, I think it, it doesn't create problems. Otherwise, if you just leave blank spots in the form, if a jury is ever looking at it, it looks like you were not acting very carefully or thoroughly in your treatment of the patient. Uh, don't say things that are disparaging about the client or the patient. Avoid judgmental words. Keep in mind as you, as you write records, keep in mind that somebody else may be looking at these someday. Your client may be looking at them. Uh, another doctor may be looking at them. A lawyer or a jury may be looking at them. You don't want them to come across as though you're a mean-spirited gossip or that you're unhappy with the client who seems to be a jerk or that the uh, animal's condition is something you're not too concerned with. It's just a routine visit. Uh, avoid using those kinds of words uh, as you write the records. Identify the record keeper. Simple practice on, on paper records. When people are entering record entries into paper records, they should put their initials, the date, and their initials in the margin. That identifies when the record was created and it identifies who created it. Uh, word to the wise, uh, keep a record somewhere, just a list of all the people who have worked for you, all the people who have made entries in your records. So that way if you're ever asked in a deposition who made this entry, you can look very quickly and say, well the person's initials were JG, so that must have been Jesse Green. Uh, rather than looking at it saying, gosh, I, I remember we had this guy who worked for us for a few weeks, but I can't remember his name. Uh, make sure you identify the record keeper. Make sure you keep a list of those initials so you can answer questions later. Uh, don't enter data prematurely. Uh, sometimes when you have a quiet time in your office, you may be looking at your schedule and see what's coming forward the next afternoon or the next day, and you may decide that you can go ahead and get a head start on entering those records problem with doing that is what happens if the client cancels or the patient's not available or the condition is not what you expect it to be. Uh, if you go through and enter data prematurely, you start your entries in advance, you run the risk, a very great risk, that you're going to have to strike through that and correct it. And then you have a very difficult time explaining why you made that entry 
that was not factual. Uh, records need to be kept in a legible manner. Uh, other people need to be able to read them. Remember, one of the reasons for keeping records is so that other doctors, other professionals, can take over the treatment of the patient. If your records aren't legible, they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, your records should be kept as consistently as possible. If uh, uh, somebody is looking at your records from one patient to another to another, or from one visit to another to another, they should be relatively consistent. I mean, certainly over time and over years, I would expect your record keeping skills or habits to change. But for the most part, those records should be as consistent and, and reasonable so it doesn't look like you were over documenting a particular situation or a particular visit or under documenting a particular visit. If you see contradictions, again if you see mistakes in your notes, make appropriate corrections or explain why that exists there. Anytime something unusual happens, uh, whether it's the somebody might be injured or somebody claims they were injured or an animal uh, may or may not have been injured or an animal's reaction is is not what you would expect uh, you should document those events uh, document them as objectively as you can uh, because that may be information that's useful to you or to others in the future uh, avoid ambiguous words try to be as specific as you can be if you remember the old dragnet series and how matter-of-fact they would be in describing what was going on. Uh, that's the kind of language you may want to use in your records. You want to be precise. You want to be specific. You don't want to be ambiguous. Don't just write the animal's gait improved. Explain why the gait improved or what changed about the gait so that it's clearer to somebody else or if the animal's behavior changed. Uh, don't just write something general like animal acted like they were not in as much pain. Write down why you believe they weren't in as much pain and why you think that's an, an appropriate conclusion. Record all contact with the client and the patient. Uh, one thing you have to do as a professional is develop a system for recording all phone calls, all visits, and make sure that all winds up in the client's and the patient's file. Don't criticize other providers. Uh, one of the risks of doing that is there may come a time that they wind up looking at the file. So you don't want them to see that you're being critical or petty with them. Uh, don't say... Sorry, I'm having some trouble with my PowerPoint. Um, exclude frivolous remarks, uh, comments about the client, uh, or things that really have nothing to do with the, the patient's care. Uh, you know, maybe the client is a whiner, or the client is uh, uh, overly concerned with the cost of care, uh, and they're, you know, instead of writing down that they're concerned with the cost of care, you write down things like they're greedy or they're, they're misers, and that's not the right response not the right kind of language to use in records. Uh, as you make records, especially with paper, well only with paper records, use the same pen for each entry. Uh, if document examiners are looking at it in the future and they see that several different pens were used to create a record, that may raise a question about the authenticity of the record and whether it was changed after the fact. Um, as we've talked about before, don't alter records. Make changes appropriately and transparently. Develop a system in your office so that when outside reports are added to the patient's record, you somehow document or record that you reviewed that report. Maybe something as, initial, as, as simple as, as you just initialing the report before it goes into the patient's file. And that helps to demonstrate that you did look at it before it went into the patient's file and you actually considered what the report said and how that would affect the patient's treatment. Computerized records. One of the 
greatest benefits of computerized records is the cut and paste or automatic generation of notes. It can make record keeping a whole lot easier. It can save the doctor a lot of time. Of course, one of the greatest risks of computerized records is that the doctor will use that cut and paste command to replace the thought process. If you're going to use computer generated notes, the doctor should take some time for each record to customize it to that particular patient in that particular situation. Uh, that will help to demonstrate that the doctor wasn't just using cut and paste, but was actually thinking about how they were treating the patient. Uh, develop a legend for abbreviations. Somewhere in your office there should be a page saying these are the abbreviations we use in our records and the doctor and their staff should all use those abbreviations consistently so that as someone is looking at the record they don't see an abbreviation that means one thing when it was written by the doctor and means something else when it was written by the assistant. Uh, usually it's a best practice to keep financial records and clinical information separated. It gives the doctor an ability to communicate their focus is on that clinical information and not on that billing or financial information. If you use standardized forms, make sure they fit the way you practice or customize the forms to fit the way you practice. Uh, in today's day and age with, with uh, computerized, uh, the ability to generate records or forms on a computer, there really is no excuse for using a paper form that doesn't fit or match the way somebody practices. Uh, how long should you keep the records? My general recommendation is to keep the records as long as possible. Uh, the different states are going to have different rules about how long veterinary records need to be kept. Uh, make sure you're keeping them for at least that time period. Uh, but besides that time period, I think it is helpful to the doctor to have those records for a longer time. Part of the reason for that is the client may come back after being away for several years, and you can certainly impress the client if you can pull up the records and access the records from the previous visits. And certainly in the, the days of all paper records, that would have been very difficult to do. But in the world we live in today where it is easy to scan paper records into a, a computer or to save computerized records onto a hard drive that just doesn't take a lot of space or into the cloud, uh, that's something that can be done very easily and inexpensively. And I think it communicates to your client uh, the level or the degree of care you have for, the, for your patients. Uh, review and archive files. If you have records that go back for years and years, you don't want to have to go through all those records every time you access a patient's file or a client's file. Uh, take records that are old and out of date and move them, if they're electronic, move them to a different folder so that they're out of the way. Or if they're paper records, you may want to archive them into a storage area so that your office doesn't develop that cluttered look. If a client is being non-compliant, they're not following your instructions, they're not keeping their appointments, they're not following uh, diet or exercise recommendations, you need to document that in your records. Uh, sometimes when malpractice suits happen, the client will forget that they weren't following your instructions. And if you haven't documented it, it may be very difficult to argue about. You're much better off when you receive that information to document it. And it also helps you, you protect yourself not only from malpractice cases, but it also helps you understand when you're looking at the patient's progress, why the patient may not be progressing or may not be progressing as quickly as you would expect. Proofreading. It only takes a few minutes to proofread correspondence and reports, but too many doctors fail to do that, and they send information out of their, out of their office that includes all sorts of typographical errors, misspellings, the wrong name, uh, 
uh, all kinds of things. Uh, that creates a very unprofessional appearance. It creates an appearance that the doctor is not being very cautious and strengthens the argument that the doctor was being careless and negligent. So take the time to proofread that correspondence in those reports. And, and I have to tell you the worst ones I've seen have come from medical doctors. It seems like they sit down with a dictation device, dictate for a few minutes, and you wind up with a two-page report or a three-page report that consists of one paragraph and maybe three sentences. And that's very difficult to interpret or understand. And it certainly doesn't create a favorable impression for that doctor. Some of the information to include in the records. Uh, for chiropractic, you should identify the segments adjusted and the technique employed. Uh, that can help you decide in the future, based on the animal's response, whether you need to try something different in the way you adjust or where you adjust the animal. Uh, you should also identify where you adjusted the animal, what table, what equipment, what room was used. Um, certainly in some situations, like a barn, that may not be very clearly delineated, but certainly in your office that is something you can specify. And Sometimes it becomes important to identify what equipment was used or it may help clarify what was done or not done with the patient. And it's just something that shouldn't take a lot of time to uh, document. Now one thing uh, that's a little bit different with some of the veterinary rules, for the, for the most part the chiropractic rules do not specify what needs to be in the records. Some of the states do have some specific requirements but generally they're, they're, they're pretty broad and in general about what needs to be kept in the records. But in Texas we have a specific administrative rule that is very specific about what needs to be in the records for veterinary care. Uh, for you chiropractors when you're working with a veterinarian you want to be sure that your records comply with this regulation. And that way when you send your records to the veterinarian it'll show that their records comply with this rule. Uh, records should include the name and address of the client, patient identity, patient history, dates of visits. Now, immunization record may not be something that the chiropractor handles directly, but it may be something, if it's relevant to the patient's care, that the patient should obtain from the veterinarian. Uh, or maybe the, the, the chiropractor just refers to records kept by the veterinarian. Uh, the animal's weight, if that's required for diagnosis or treatment. Of course, with larger animals, it may be difficult or impossible to obtain weight, so it's not necessary in those situations. Uh, temperature, if it's required for diagnosis. Any lab analysis, any x-rays. Uh, of course, this should not be part of animal chiropractic. This last item, there should not be drugs prescribed or dispensed. Animal chiropractic should be drugless. Uh, other details necessary to substantiate the examination, etc. Uh, the signed acknowledgement where the client consents to chiropractic care as an alternative to traditional veterinary care. That signed acknowledgement, like I mentioned previously, has to be a part of the veterinarian's records. As the professionals work together, sometimes each professional may assume the other professional has already taken care of this. The veterinarian assumes the chiropractor is going to get it, the chiropractor assumes the veterinarian is going to get it. I recommend that both professionals should obtain the consent from the client. That means that will reflect that both professionals had this discussion with the client and both professionals got the client's permission to proceed with animal chiropractic care. That'll do the most to protect you from any claims in the future. And by doing this for the benefit of the veterinarian, you know, the veterinary board goes to the veterinarian to look at the veterinarian's records, and they're getting ready to uh, uh, find the veterinarian because they don't have that signed acknowledgement. Veterinarian is not going to think very highly of the chiropractors that they're working with. On the other hand, if the veterinary board comes in to look at the file and tells the veterinarian, hey, doctor, you missed this. You didn't have it. But it's a good thing you were working with this chiropractor because they got it for you. And there it is in your file now. 
So make sure this is done by both professionals. Uh, it's kind of the belt and suspenders approach. It only takes a minute. It, it helps both professionals develop their relationship with the client and their trust of the client and the professionals and that they're trying to do what's best for the animal. Uh, each entry in the record should identify the veterinarian who performed or supervised. So again, chiropractors, if you're providing care under the supervision, and in Texas the only way you can treat animals is under the supervision of a veterinarian, you should identify that veterinarian. And as part of supervising or, or helping them supervise you, you should provide them with a copy of the notes after each visit so that the veterinarian's records are always current and, and they're ready to, to give you suggestions or advice if problems occur. Correct your mistakes in an appropriate manner. I know we've already talked about this before. It needs to be transparent. In paper records, you draw the single line, go down to the next date, today's date, so that you document when you made the change. In computerized records, make sure that audit trail is being created. One of the things people do when they install new software is sometimes they will walk through it and try to turn off things that seem to slow it down. In creating this audit trail may slow it down just a little bit, but the benefit of having that audit trail gives you a, a much better proof of the accuracy and the genuineness of your records. Uh, changing the file after a claim is made. Uh, it's tempting after you receive a demand letter or tempting after you receive a citation in a lawsuit to go back and look at the records and, and maybe fix some things that you think could have been written better. That is always, always a mistake. It may not be caught every time, but once that change in the records has been detected, once it's been proven, the doctor has no credibility. So it may be that the doctor provided great care for the patient, but because they went back and changed the records, it now looks like the doctor is dishonest. So even if the doctor does testify that they provided great care for the patient, no one's going to believe them, even if it's the truth. So the situation when you change those records, once the doctor is caught, there really is not much to do with that case except to settle it. And usually it's not going to settle on very favorable terms at that point. So the Kaplan case was a, a case involving medical malpractice where the doctor did go back and change the records. Now in this particular case what he did was take a page out of a daily notes of paper records and replace that page with a rewritten page. Uh, problem with what he did is when he replaced it he used a form that was not printed until sometime well after the date on the on those notes. So the do notes were, were written let's say in 2011 but the form wasn't printed until 2013. So once that was detected, it was pretty difficult for the doctor to argue that he was being honest. Uh, many states also have a rule that if the professional loses the client's file, there is a presumption that the doctor acted negligently. In other words, they get to skip through some of the steps in proving their negligence claim and go almost directly to the issue of damages and proximate cause. So losing the file is almost always a mistake. So last thing I want to do for you here, oops, not sure why that happened. Uh, last thing I want to do for you here is just share with you some general advice. Um, this is not particularly legal or ethics, but just something to uh, something for you to consider. Uh, this is one of those old internet things, advice from an old farmer. First piece of advice is to keep skunks, bankers, and lawyers at a distance. Uh, most of them don't leave a good feel after you deal with them. Uh, one way to keep lawyers at a distance is to avoid situations where you're accused of malpractice. Uh, life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Especially as we look at some of these regulations, you're going to see regulations that you may not like and you may not want to comply with. Just remember life is simpler when you plow around the stump. 
instead of trying to disobey the regulation and just see what happens, you're better off following the regulation and maybe dealing with it and getting rid of that stump some other day. Forgive your enemies messes up their heads. If you carry around anger, uh, it's only going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt other people. Uh, forgive people who've done things that are wrong to you. Uh, don't corner something that you know is meaner than you. Uh, don't pick a fight with somebody that's going to beat you up. Uh, so I watch people from time to time pick fights with state boards. They think the rule's wrong and the way they're going to deal with it is by disobeying it. I got news for you. The state board is better funded and is often meaner than you are. So that's almost always a mistake. You cannot unsay a cruel word. If you say something mean to somebody, you can't unsay it or make it go away. So think extra hard before you say things that hurt other people. Every path has a few puddles. Don't expect life to be a bed of roses. There are going to be problems. There are going to be days that things go great. And there are going to be days where you think things are not going so great. Just understand it's a process and keep working hard and working honestly and things will get better. When you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. Pay attention to the people you surround yourself with. What kind of staff do you work with? What kind of clients do you work with? If you work with people who are dishonest, people who are in it only for the money, uh, people who don't care about animals, people who don't love animals, you're going to, some of that reputation is going to rub off on you. Be careful. Uh, by the same token, don't judge folks by their relatives. People don't get to choose their relatives. Uh, don't assume that just because their relative is a jerk that they must be jerks as well. Remember that silence is sometimes the best answer. Our natural human instinct is to fill silence by talking. And sometimes the best thing to do is to keep your mouth shut. Instead of saying something that hurts somebody, and instead of saying something that demonstrates your ignorance or lack of professionalism. Live a good, honorable life. Then when you get older and think back, you'll enjoy it a second time. Uh, do things right. You'll sleep better. You'll live longer. You'll do better. Don't interfere with something that ain't bothering you not. Kind of the same idea. Don't pick fights with something meaner than you. If you don't have to pick a fight with something, don't. If you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. If things are not going well and you're contributing to the problem, stop contributing. Now, biggest troublemaker you'll probably ever have to deal with watches you from the mirror every morning. It's really easy, and this I think again is human nature, to blame other people when things go wrong. It's the government, it's the clients, it's the market, it's whatever it is, it's somebody else's fault. When we really need to look at ourselves and think about what we are doing to cause the problem and to make it worse. Good judgment comes from experience. A lot of that comes from bad judgment. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have bad results. When that happens, you should learn the lesson. What went wrong? How do you prevent it from happening? How do you make it better if it does happen again in the future? So it's not as tough on the client or on you. Letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back in. Before you release confidential information, before you pick a fight, before you start a, a, a conflict with somebody, think real hard about how difficult it's going to be to bring it to an end and put that cat back in the bag. If you get to thinking you're a person of some influence, try ordering somebody else's dog around. Dogs listen to their owners, you know that, and you have no influence over the other people's dogs. You can have a lot of influence over yourself and over your own conduct, but you have very limited influence over other people. Hope you found some of this information helpful. Again, I want to commend all of you for taking the initiative to uh, uh, attend the continuing education class on animal chiropractic. I think it's a wonderful profession.
I think it is an underserved market and I think there are some wonderful opportunities both for veterinarians and for chiropractors. I hope you enjoy the course and that your profession is, is long and prosperous. Thank you very much.